Income Tax 2022-2023 Income Tax Formula Example Using Tax Forms and Tax Software Let's do some wealth preservation with tax preparation. Here we are in our example form 1040. We're currently using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to it, it's a great tool to run different scenarios with. You can also get access to the form 1040 related forms and schedules at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. So we're gonna start with our standard scenario with the single filer. We've got the name up top, Mr. Anderson, and the address up top. And we're gonna be focusing down mainly on the income equation components down below, comparing and contrasting it to what we saw with the formula. So recall the tools that we have in order to do tax law and tax preparation. We've got the formula format, we've got the actual uh, tax forms themselves and the software. So we use the formulas over here in order to help us to visualize. This is what you probably have kind of more in your head when you're trying to visualize what's going to happen. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Happen as you do data input into the system or contemplate the different scenarios when you're discussing something with a client. And then of course, we're often gonna use the tax software in practice to do the da actual data input. So we'll do the data input, not manually inputting it into the forms and reading each line item of the forms oftentimes, but rather doing the data input in the tax software, jumping to the forms and seeing if the forms are then populating in a way that we visualized would be populated, possibly using tax software to jump to like a summary form, which gives us a quick view of that kind of a uh, quick view of the formula type of format actually within the software. So we're gonna, we also wanna think about uh, when we might use the software versus a formula. Obviously when you're conceptualizing something, then you're gonna conceptualize something in formula format in your mind. I also use a tax formula format in Excel to kind of recalculate items separately from the tax software to help justify or verify the data input that has going into the tax software. So in other words, if I do the tax software, uh, then the software helps me to do the calculations. But if I then enter the data again from the source documents into Excel, it often helps me to better understand what's happening so I can communicate it to a client. And it helps me to double check the information because uh, it's quite easy to have a miss key with uh, taxation and it's more difficult to have a miss key or you have more internal controls with bookkeeping due to the double entry accounting system. This is something when I learned taxes coming from an accounting world was frustrating to me because the whole reason I kind of liked the, uh, the accounting system is that you have the double entry accounting system helping you with that double check. You don't have that kind of thing and therefore you have to input your own kind of internal controls to make sure that you're getting things right when you do the data input into the tax return. The tax formula helps in that as well. So we will actually build this worksheet uh, in future presentations. I think that's also a great exercise to better understand the structure of this and also to, to try to build something that you can use in alignment with your data input practice uh, as well when you're actually doing tax preparation. But let's just get a feel for each line here. So we've got the income, the adjustments to income, there's our AGI, then we take the greater of the itemized or standard deductions, uh, and then I'll get into a uh, qualified business income, kind of muddies the water, we'll talk about that later a bit. Uh, and then we've got the taxable income, then the rate is applied, and this is gonna be the tax calculation, and then we've got uh, tax credits, other taxes, the, the total tax, and then the payments and refundable credits. So notice 
when I construct this Excel formula, we'll actually use these one line item items and then we'll put everything else on another schedule, which is, I would think, the ideal way to create the tax return if it was created from scratch today. It hasn't been. They've been hodgepodging the tax return together since it's been in inception, right? That's why it's kind of messy. Okay, so if I go back on over here, there's going to be an impact up top, whether the filing status is single, married filing joint, married filing separate. And so we'll talk about that impact a bit as we get down below, but it's going to have an impact on the standard deduction and the tax calculations that will be put in place. We've got the name uh, and the address, of course, being important. We've got then down here, the main thing being the uh, dependents. So dependents are going to have an, an impact possibly on child tax credit, other dependent credits, uh, and so on as well could have an impact on the tax brackets depending on if you're head of household versus single. We'll talk more about that in future presentations. The income line item in our tax formula over here, we just put as one line item. Notice in the tax return, they've got this whole first page dedicated to income. So, and they have other other schedules as well over here that we'll, we'll look into a schedule one additional income uh, adjustments in income. Again, if you built this from scratch, you would think they would put everything on Schedule 1 and just have like one line maybe on the Form 1040 to make it more like a streamlined system as you might build in like an Excel thing. But they didn't do that because in the past they wanted to have as few forms as possible. Multiple forms aren't as much of a problem these days because it's mainly done online. So that's, you know, that's just what happens. So the form W-2 is oftentimes going to be the type of form that will be populated uh, in many tax returns. I would put that in a different schedule over here on our formula. Here's the W-2 form that's feeding into this first page, uh, the 100,000. Now we have a whole bunch of other kinds of income that we could have, TIP income, Medicare, uh, taxable dependent care, employer provided adoption, wages, tax exempt interest, interest, dividends, and so on. So obviously a whole lot of different things feed into the income line. And we also could have things like business income, say on a schedule C, for example. And we can see that the schedule one here also has additional income lines and these then feed into the uh, form 1040. So we'll dive more into that in future presentations and we'll build our Excel a sheet to mirror that we finally get down to the total income down below and then we got the adjustments to income so these are kind of like the above the line deductions now you might not have any of those let's take a simple scenario and say that we don't that would then give us to the adjusted gross income of the 100,000 this being the line item that's going to be useful for us to calculate the uh, phase outs on things like credits. So that's a very important number. You got the standard deduction or itemized deduction. So the standard deduction is populated over here with the general rules. So uh, 12,950 for single, basically doubled for married, file, and joint, head of household in the middle. So we started here with the 12,950 populating automatically. That's not something we entered in the data. It's pulling that from mainly the filing status that we chose up here as the single filer. So that's going to be uh, that. And then if the itemized deductions were greater than that, then we would be itemizing. That's usually higher income tax returns where that is the case. This qualified business income deduction was put in place a few years ago. It's a, it's a kind of a really messy type of thing. And we'll dive into that a little bit more when we get into the, uh, to the, to the sole proprietors and self uh, employment income and that kind of stuff. And then we've got the subtotal of the 12,950. And then we finally get to the taxable income of the 8750. So if I look at that in formula format, this 12,950, I'm pulling in from my worksheet down here by pulling it from the table uh, that I put for standard married head of household and then some other adjustments in some cases that we'll talk more about later and that'll give us the taxable income. So I can kind of recalculate it in my Excel formula. And then this average tax, notice I'm looking at the average tax. I'm not actually calculating it here because remember it's a progressive tax system. I would have to look up the tax on the tax tables 
in order to calculate the tax manually and it'll even get more complex than that if I have different kind of things involved such as dividend income possibly being taxed at a different rate, capital gains income possibly being taxed at a different rate and so on. Therefore, I'm often going to be dependent on the tax software to then populate into my worksheet. So I'm going to say page two, I'm going to let the system do the calculations. I double check, I double verify that I recalculate this number 8750 and then I let the system calculate the 14774 for the most part and then type that into here. So if I type in the 14774, I can back into the average tax, which would simply be that divided by the taxable income. So that's 17, I would expect to be on my tax summary where we have the average or effective tax at the 17, same thing. Marginal tax bracket is the highest tax bracket, right? So that's gonna be on something I can kind of recalculate. And then I can also, on my sheet, I can basically read uh, data input the bottom half of the equation, which is gonna have to deal with the credits, the other taxes, and the payments that we're making. So we're not at the end of the day here. We've got we've got amounts from schedule two and three, and we're gonna add those up. We got the child credit, and then uh, adding the amounts from schedule three and line eight. So these are the schedules on the left. We'll dive into those in more detail. And finally, you'll get down to the total tax, and then you have the payments. So that usually includes mainly the federal income tax withheld. And then finally, you're gonna get to the amount you owe. So if I didn't have any any other stuff going on down here, the amount would be the same, except they, they added 533 of penalties because I was underpaid. So penalties 533, this plus this gets us to the 15307, and there's the, the 15307. So we can kind of double check it that way. Now, just to give us a little bit of variation on this, if I adjusted some other stuff up top, let's say I had uh, interest income, let's just add another income line item. I'd say, okay, boom. Uh, let's say that we have interest income of from the bank and bank one, and, and it was uh, it was 7,000 of interest income. Okay, so I'm gonna pull that over. That would pull in then to this page on line one. You possibly could have a schedule B if it's over a certain threshold, but it's pulling over to the first page of the 1040 as well. I can mirror that on my formula. I'm not gonna put it on the face of the formula. I'm gonna have another schedule that feeds into it, right? So that I can have this first page just as a formula. And I'm gonna say, let's go to the income line and just say that I have somewhere in the, this is W2 income. I have a schedule B here, which I said, what did I say, 700? Uh, seven, I said 7,000, 7,000, a lot of interest. So that then would pull into the first page. Now it's included in that 107 and I can match that over. I can say, okay, does the 107 match here? 107 ties out and then my my 12, that ties out my 12, 950 has still tied out. So that looks good. That gets me to the, to the 9450. So I could say, okay, yeah, that looks right. And then I'd have to recalculate the tax because I'm not gonna do the tax calculation. I'm gonna let the system do that. That's at the 16414. So I could say, okay, 16414. And that gets us to the 1750 average. So I can say, does that match the average tax? 17.5 looks right. And then the second half, we go into the second half, right? And so then I can also, if I, so obviously the income line items can get quite complicated. If I had an adjustment to the above, uh, adjustments to income, the above the line, that's in schedule one, which is right here. And so one of the big ones in here is often gonna be the uh, IRA payments. So let's, and I can actually jump from here to the data input form. So let's look for the IRA. Actually, this is the income, I want line two. I want line two or page two. And then I'm gonna go into the IRA deduction, which is line 20. And then you could oftentimes in software, right click and jump to the data input. And then I'll say, I'll say it's the maximum. So I'm just gonna put a one there for the maximum. 
and that'll put the max of 6,000. Now this form then is gonna feed into the 1040. That looks a lot like how you might might put together an Excel worksheet now. That makes kind of sense, right? If you were to mirror that in Excel, I would say another schedule, uh, which is going to be deductions, adjustments to income, and then we've got an IRA, which I put 6,000 in an IRA. This number then is gonna feed into the first page here, and that's gonna give us then our 6,000 adjustment to the 101. So now here I've adjusted this 101, that looks correct. I still have the 12, uh, 950, that's the same, which changes this number to 8850. That looks correct, 8850. My tax is now gonna have changed from 16414 to whatever they calculate on page two, 141994, was it? 14994, and then I could check my average tax is at 17% again, and I can kind of double check that. So if I go back on up and say, okay, that's, there could be multiple line items in there that I can adjust for that gets us to our adjusted gross income. Then we have the standard or itemized deductions. Now, if we switch to a married filer, then I've switched over here to filing a joint. So now I've got the same 100,000, but my standard deduction has now basically doubled. I can mirror that on my software by saying this number, I'm going to pull it from down here to 25.9. And so that should then populate uh, there. And so now we're at this 75,100. So, so that gets us to the 75,100, the 29 there. And then my tax, of course, would change again. So I can say my tax is now at uh, 8604. So 8604 on the tax, 11.5% on uh, the average rate. So there is that. So if I go back to the first page, and so we'll get into this one later, and that kind of verifies the tax. Now on page two, then we could have a whole bunch of other credits and whatnot that we'll dive into in future presentations and we'll talk about when it might be useful to recalculate those credits in our formula and when it might be useful to depend to some degree on the software possibly to help you out with the credits because things like an earned income tax credit is quite complicated to recalculate without software so the question is how much recalculating how much double checking do i want to do to verify the data entry is correct and that the software is populating correctly and so that i can actually explain what is happening to like a client uh and not saying well it's just magic that's what the tax that's what the software did right and so then but we would also have the withholdings typically so let's say i jump to the withholdings area and say uh oftentimes the withholdings let's say were you know 15,000 on the withholding so i'm going to jump back on over so that's going to be on page two so there's the withholdings so if i jump back on over to my formula and if i was to populate the withholdings i would have another another area for payments which i'm going to say the withholdings i said 15,000 are going to pull into page one of our formula so there's the 15 and so I'm left with a refund of the 6396. And if I populate that, that should match what I have here, 6396. So you can see how these two things kind of work in tandem. Some people might not use an Excel worksheet, but they'll but they'll use this tax formula a lot instead of jumping to the actual tax form on the form 1040 to summarize when they're jumping back and forth. But I think visualizing it in double and entering it again into Excel is really a great exercise to kind of understand what's going on and to, to use in practice as like a double verification. So that's what I would do to kind of help you with that, that uh, uh, data input problem. And you might, if you're working in a staff situation, have say the staff uh, enter this stuff into the tax return and then you double check it. And you know, someone could, it could be part of a review process to put it into like an Excel formula kind of to give you a better double check on uh, on the data input or something like that, or have them do it. You can come up with that, what different systems for it. But we will build an Excel uh, worksheet like this, and then we'll kind of adjust it as we do data input in our practice problems moving forward.